Thank you, everybody. Welcome. Um, welcome. My name is Peter Larson. I'm the chair of a small Ottawa NGO called the Ottawa Forum on Israel Palestine. And this God, is how much do you? This is one of a series of presentations, monthly presentations, educational presentations on the complicated and emotional Israel Palestine issue. Today, we want to talk about Hamas. And I'm going to try to see if we can respond to the common question among Canadians who is Hamas and why won't they just make peace? Many Canadians don't understand Hamas. And I've got, we're lucky to have three experts from different areas of Palestine that will share their views and their understanding of the issue. Next slide. Um, before I get into that, oh, I wanted to just comment on the fact that, um, of course, all the news is filled with um, Russia, Ukraine these days. It's very hard to get any other topic on. Um, uh, and I can't help but observe that uh, Canada's response to the um, Russia, Russian invasion of Ukraine um, and our, our request that the International Criminal Court probe uh, Russian activities can't stand out in more dramatic contrast to our, um, uh, on the other hand, our opposition to Palestinians invoking the International Criminal Court. I think it's just one other very sad example of, of the uh, lack of principle uh, behind Canadian public policy in this area. Now we'll come back to our main topic, which is our agenda for today. Um, I'm going to give um, a few minutes, a few background uh, information, uh, um, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I do not assume that everybody on this call knows a lot about the Israel-Palestine issue, or particularly don't know a lot about Hamas. So I'm going to cover that ground. For those of you who already know it well, I apologize. Just bear with it. It's not very long. It's about eight and a half minutes long. Um, and then I will proceed to interview our three Canadian, uh, sorry, our three Palestinian experts. Um, and what's exceptional, not only are they exceptional people, but what's particularly important to me and to us is that they come from quite different perspectives, um, perhaps politically, but I'm also talking about geographically. So one actually uh, lives and works in Gaza, one uh, normally works in the West Bank, and uh, one is inside uh, what Palestinians would call Palestine of 48, or what uh, we might call the um, uh, State of Israel today. Uh, then we'll move into a question and answer period. And in the QA, I would ask people to use the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, we've enabled chat so you can make comments as you want and go along. You can talk to each other um, uh, uh, using the chat, but we will only be picking up questions from the Q&A function, and then we'll adjourn. And just before I leave, I remember this is an ongoing series of webinars. Our next one uh, is, is it fair to call Israel an apartheid state? Uh, that uh, presentation, of course, follows the fact that this issue has again be ra been raised by Amnesty International, their most recent report. And we're going to be interviewing uh, a, a, a British Israeli man, Jonathan Cook, who uh, lives, uh, has lived in Nazareth. He's married to a Palestinian citizen of Israel, has two children who are Palestinian citizens of Israel, and he will help us understand practically uh, what is the situation of the Palestinian citizens of Israel, and up to you to decide whether or not you think the label apartheid uh, uh, fits the bill. Next slide. So just as a brief um, backgrounder, I want to start with the Nakba, starting on the 29th of uh, November 1947, the day after the UN vote. Um, over the next six or eight months, three quarters of a million of Palestinians were expelled. Many of them fled to Gaza. And Gaza today is the largest concentration of Palestinian refugees. And that's very germane to our history, to understanding of Hamas. Next slide. What is Hamas? Well, I, I, I barely dare to try to pronounce it in Arabic. Harakat al muqawama al Islamiyah. Um, but the point is that H-A-M-A-S is kind of like NDP, New Democratic Party. It's, a, it's a, an acronym for the name of the party. It was a, it's a political party. Uh, it means Islamic resistance movement. It was formed in 1987 during the first Nidafada. And a lot of its support came from, the, from opposition to or dissatisfaction with the main secular Palestinian party, Fatah, which many felt was not sufficiently standing up to Israel. Uh, and that is a picture there of its founder, Sheikh 
Ahmed Yassin. Next slide. Um, if you want to know more about Hamas, you can go, they have a website, you can go on the website and you can get updates, their news items and so on and so forth. Something that we very rarely I think is done in Canada, but I think it's always useful to get different points of view. And this one is rel rel relatively easily accessible on the internet. Thank you. So at first near its founding, Hamas was largely focused on liberating Palestine through armed struggle. And it issued a covenant in 1988. And that covenant issued, included many statements that were clearly anti-Semitic and caused a lot of discomfort in the West. For example, on the worldwide power of Jews, it said that Jews were behind the French Revolution, the Communist Revolution. With their money, they formed secret societies such as Freemasons and Rotary Clubs. I was surprised this. I've been a member of the Rotary for many years, and I didn't know that uh, this was the, the case. In Article 3, 2032, they also said their plan is embodied in the protocols of the elders of Zion. Now, I think everybody on this call will know that none of that makes any sense or is true. And in mm -hmm. fact, as we'll see in a minute, Hamas has walked all that back, but that has been, been used by great, to great advantage by the, the, the supporters of Israel and the critics of Hamas. Next slide. In 2005, Hamas opted for a change in strategy to participate in elections. And it, those elections were held in 2006 and Western countries, including Canada, sent international uh, observers. In fact, Alexander Boulouris, who's now an NDP member of parliament, was uh, in uh, Gaza watching the elections in 2006. And th that time it was fully expected that Fatah would win and Hamas would be crushed. But next slide, it didn't work out that way. In fact, Hamas won a majority. Not only did they win a majority of seats, but they won in most of the areas of Palestine, both the West Bank and Gaza itself. Now, this election was, the international observers said it was free and fair, uh, but the Bush uh, administration and Israel and Canada were shocked by it, and they refused to accept the results of the election. Imagine, for example, if the NDP were to win in Canada and the Americans say, we're not going to recognize it. That's a, a poor analogy, but not, not totally out of the order. Hamas, recognizing that they were um, in a difficult position, proposed a national unity government with Fatah. But that was um, refused. Israel and most Western countries ignored the election results, and they continued to, rec to recognize uh, Mahmoud Abbas and Fatah as the government of Palestine. Next slide. After the elections, Hamas was completely denied participation in the government. In fact, many Hamas candidates were, were arrested. But Hamas was able to maintain its control in the area where it had especially strong support, which was in Gaza. And so today we have a situation where Fatah controls the West Bank and Hamas controls Gaza. And there have not been elections for the last 15 years. In fact, elections were proposed for last fall, uh, but they were canceled. Uh, for, and there are different theories about why those elections were canceled. But certainly one of the uh, um, credible theories is that there was concern that Hamas would win the election and so the PA did not want those elections to go forward. Next slide. Then in 2017, as I mentioned, Hamas rewrote its charter. And among other things, the new charter took away that crude anti-Semitic language. It made it clear that the Hamas fight was against Zionism as opposed to being against Jews. It somewhat downplayed the Islamic or religious nature of the party and opened the door to accepting a two-state solution, but retained its right to use military force. Now, the um, Globe and Mail correspondent, Patrick Martin, at the time, thought this charter was a very significant development. But uh, of course, Israel said the new charter is not significant and prefers to make reference to the original charter with its anti-Semitic uh, elements. Next slide. So today, Hamas is a political party with members all across Palestinian society, including in Israel, Jerusalem, West Bank, and in the refugee camps as well. Uh, to outsiders, its internal structure is unknown and its total membership is unknown, but it's estimated that it has maybe 10,000 members in a military wing, but it has also a political wing, which forms the government in Gaza, providing normal government services, education, health, water, sewer, and so on. And last year, when uh, all of the, there were these uh, conflict around Sheikh Jarrah and then around the the Al-Aqsa Mosque, Hamas flags were seen at Palestinian demonstrations inside Israel. 
Okay, so that's the end of my PowerPoint uh, presentation. I'm sorry for those of you who knew all that information. We can stop the sc uh, screen sharing. And now I just want to welcome again and introduce uh, three the three panelists. Thank you so much for, for being here today. Um, I'll start with um, Diana Butu. Diana is um, a Palestinian lawyer. She's a Palestinian Canadian lawyer. Um, Diana is uh, currently living in Haifa, uh, in the state of Israel. So she is a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Uh, Diana, thank you so much. And I, I should mention that in two weeks' time, Diana will be participating in the great launch of Together Against Apartheid, which is an event organized by is uh, Independent Jewish Voices Canada. And Diana will be one. And uh, that's mean, if you wouldn't mind putting the link to that um, in um, the chat so people can pick up the reference to that if they want. Next, I'll introduce Jonathan Kutab. Now, Jonathan is a um, uh, West Banker. Jo Jonathan, you are from, I believe you're from Bethlehem, if I'm not mistaken, from- Jerusalem, actually. Jerusalem, East sorry, Jerusalem. okay, thank you. Uh, Jonathan um, uh, is a lawyer. He is the author of a, a book, uh, Beyond the Two-State Solution. He is also the founder of al Haq, which is one of those eight organizations that was recently declared a terrorist organization by the, the state of Israel. And just recently, and today actually, Jonathan has an article in Intifada, in the electronic Intifada magazine, about his visit to the Canadian embassy in Tel Aviv and his discussions with our ambassador there, an excellent article and it gives you a bit of a sense of what it's like to be in the embassy and trying to, I'll say, talk sense to our ambassador. So Jonathan, thank you for that, for that article and welcome today. Thank you. Finally, I'm thrilled to have um, Dr. Moshir Amer. Um, <laughs> he's been giving me lessons on pronouncing his <laughs> name properly. Um, Moshir, is, properly. Moshir is a, a friend of mine. I met Moshir, I think the first time, but, five years ago in Gaza. I think I met you again the second time I was in Gaza. Yeah. He is a professor at the Islamic University of Gaza. Moshir, thank you so, so much for spending time with us. Thanks a lot, Peter. Thanks for having me. Actually, I'm gonna start with you, Moshir, since you're at the Islamic <laughs> University of Gaza, and since for most Canadians, Gaza is kind of identified with Hamas or vice versa, rightly or wrongly. Um, just tell us a little bit about the university. Most Canadians would assume, I think that something called the Islamic University of Gaza would like be a, a big um, a madrasa where you spend most of your time studying the Quran. Um, is it a, <laughs> would, would, um, Canadians, would Canadians think of the Islamic University of Gaza as a, a real university? What, what do you teach there and um, who goes? Well, and... well I've, I'm a professor of linguistics and discourse analysis, but a little bit about myself. I am uh, uh, a Fulbright scholar. I got my a master's degree in the States and then I did my PhD in Melbourne in Australia and uh, at, since 2010 I've been teaching at the Islamic University of Gaza. This university is the leading university in the Gaza Strip and ranked as the second or the third university in the Palestinian territories. So it's according to international university uh, ranking. Uh, it is very well known for its uh, academic uh, reputation and its uh, research collaboration with universities in Europe and uh, in America and some other parts of the, uh, of the world. Just yesterday in the English department, we launched a uh, festival, uh, which is part of an international collaboration a project with the University of Glasgow. Uh, and other universities in Mexico and in, in Zimbabwe and other African countries uh, titled uh, Women, Palestinian Arts uh, and Theater, Women and Inclusive Peace. And over 120 of my students have been participating in drama sketches, um, you know, uh, and some innovative uh, artistic works, you know, uh, highlighting um, issues such as women, Palestinian women in literature, Palestinian women overseas, Shakespearean drama, um, and different kinds of uh, literary subjects and issues and themes. So Mich it's not really a madrasa, <laughs> it is a university. <laughs> uh, like any other universities, I studied in the States, I studied in Australia, so I don't see a big difference or any difference really. Just to be clear, um, there, are, there are women studying at the Islamic University yeah, of Canada. Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, the, there are about 63% of students are women, are female. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and the rest are, of course, the, the male students. And a lot of, in, in the English department, the vast majority of the students are female students. So brilliant young women, female, uh, young women who are aspiring to work as teachers, as translators, interpreters, and all kinds of areas related to the English language and, and literature. <laughs> thank you. We're going to come back to you for some more questions, but thank you for filling us in on, on that. I'm going to turn to, uh, to Jonathan. Jonathan, uh, now Jonathan, you are um, uh, um, uh, normal, from Jerusalem, you travel the world. I see that you were in Tel Aviv talking to our ambassador, but you tell me that today you're in, um, you're in Ohio, you say, because you go back and forth to the United States. But Jonathan, on the Hamas issue, um, uh, is, is it, do you subscribe to the thesis that had the elections been held um, uh, in what was it, November or whatever it was, that Hamas would have won or, or, or would have showed very strongly? What, what's your view based on what you hear from people in the West Bank or, or elsewhere, but particularly them? Well, the joke is that uh, if the elections had been held, uh, Fatah would have lost in the West Bank and Hamas would have lost in Gaza. Uh, so I think the actual results would depend on who the candidates were. Uh, Palestinians yearn for democracy. They want to see new faces. They are probably disenchantized with the Palestinian Authority thoroughly, but also they have very strong criticisms of Hamas, as I do. Uh, so the question is, is, is not whether Hamas would have won. Uh, but which candidates will we have newer, younger, uh, more active, more uh, uh, acceptable candidates? And I think the answer is yes, uh, those candidates would have won. Uh, probably more of them would be associated with some form of uh, Hamas or Islamic uh, parties. Uh, but but uh, I think you will see more progressives would have been in the mix as well. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Diana, just turning to you for, for a second, you worked for a while uh, in the negotiations unit of the PLO, I believe. And mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that the PLO, which is the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which is intended to be an umbrella organization, um, now does not include Hamas. Is that right? And what, why why not? Why, why is, who, who excluded, did they, did they quit or they kicked out or what happened there? Uh, that's a very good question. So uh, just because you're saying that you're not sure that if everybody knows the ABCs, uh, the Palestine Liberation Organization is an umbrella organization of all Palestinian political parties. And it was uh, formed many, many decades ago before Hamas was even a political party. In uh, the later years when Hamas did become a political party, it chose to exclude itself from the PLO because the PLO had gone down the path of, of uh, negotiating with Israel and Hamas didn't want to be part of this in any way, shape or form. Since that time, so officially Hamas is not part of the PLO. Since that time, the position of Hamas has changed and there has been a great deal of discussion of bringing Hamas into the PLO and having them join the PLO. But to be quite honest, uh, Peter, I'm not so sure if that would really make such a huge difference. As it stands right now, these political parties are very uh, fractured. There's a lot of um, there, there's a big split between Hamas, between Fatah, and between all of the political parties. And so what people are really looking for today is something that will bring the parties together, not simply recreating the old structures that existed. So officially, no, they're not part of the PLO. Um, there is talk of bringing them into the PLO, but I think we need to go beyond that and look towards a national unified political leadership that is able to bring in all Palestinians in a way that uh, people can have a say and be democratic at the same time. Thanks, Anna, that's very helpful. Uh, Jonathan, you um, mentioned earlier that you have some differences with Hamas, um, but you also said, uh, I've heard you argue uh, elsewhere, that you think that um, uh, Canada and other international uh, other countries should engage with Hamas they, they, to keep them out of the dialogue 
um, you, you don't really support that. Maybe you can just, because those seem to be two opposite things. G give us a, set, a sense of your disagreement and your sense of reason why you think they should be included in the discussion. Well, uh, I am a Christian for one thing. Uh, I don't believe in an Islamic state or a Christian state or a Jewish state for that matter. I tend to be uh, something of a... Uh, uh, Democrat in that sense, I'm a secularist. I want a uh, government to be uh, representative. I don't like any government or any country to have a religious uh, character. I believe in separation of religion from politics. Having said that, however, if we are going to have any kind of uh, peaceful negotiations or even engagement, we need to engage with our enemies. We need to engage with people we don't agree with. That was the whole argument when Israel refused to talk to Arafat and the PLO for many, many years, when that was taboo. And everybody was saying, you need to talk precisely with your enemies. You need to talk precisely with those that you disagree with and, and find a modicum. You may have some conditions. You may want to clarify certain uh, statements. You certainly want to uh, get rid of any uh, charter or uh, core belief that is uh, anti-Semitic or terroristic or, but in the end, you need to talk to your enemies and you need to talk with those people that you disagree with. And that includes Hamas. There is nothing that is gained uh, by having this current taboo uh, against talking with Hamas. Um uh, well, sure, I'm going to come to you in a second, but on that talk with that, I want to come back to Diana. Diana, um, uh, during the upwelling of demonstrations in May, when there were the um, Sheikh Shirah and then um, uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque and so on, uh, I, I, in my introduction, I uh, put up a flag of Hamas flags um, in Palestinian, in, in, in 48 Palestine in Israel. From where you sit or where you stand in Haifa, do you see Hamas? I mean, are you, how, how does it manifest itself in your world? How, what evidence would you have? I presume putting up a Hamas flag would be immediately arrested or, I mean, it would bring, uh, if I'm wrong, I mean, correct me, but I assume that the Israeli government would clamp down on that very hard. So it must be very difficult for Hamas supporters or friends in Israel to, to make that known. So how would you be aware of Hamas in, in 48 uh, Palestine? How would we be? I, I didn't miss. I missed the last part. How would I be? How, how would one be aware of its uh, of its presence or its uh, existence if you're in Haifa or you're in Jaffa or you're um, in, in anywhere in 48 Palestine? Well, I think, uh, Peter, it's important to put what happened in May in its proper religious context as well as political context. At the time in May, uh, this was during the holiest month of the Islamic um, calendar, which is Ramadan. And when Israel uh, took measures, it, it, it's important to bear in mind, Israel took measures to block Palestinians from accessing the Al-Aqsa Mosque during the entire month of Ramadan, but then especially on the holiest night of Ramadan, which is Leilat al-Qadr. And, uh, and so this is why we saw such a huge outpouring of support of, of people who were coming out and saying, we have the right to go and pray. I personally did not see any Hamas flags in Haifa, which is where I live. And I was at virtually all of the, the events that were happening here. Um, but I was told that there were some in Jerusalem and that's fine. This is, it's a, it's a legitimate political movement. And I think it's important for people to recognize that it is a political movement that has some support. It has support uh, from people because they believe in in it both as an alternative to, um, to Fatah and because they actually believe in its political program. So I don't think that we should be like going down the path of scaremongering and saying that this is some sort of uh, uh, evil flag. It's a flag that, that people support, that they, that they wave, that they, and it's a, it's a program that people support. Um, because of the fact that it's it's been one of these political movements that has continued 
to, to remain defiant and not cave to Israel's whims when it comes to everything from negotiations to recognition of it and, and so on. So I, I think we need to demystify the um, Hamas and what it stands for and recognize it as, as, a, as a political movement because that's exactly what it is. Thanks, Diana. Moshir, I wanna come in and just talk to you a little sure. bit about Hamas in, yeah. in Gaza. Um, I remember the last time I was there, I was had a remarkable experience. I was in a taxi, and for some reason, my 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 young Palestinian fixer friend, I got him to ask questions of the taxi driver, and the taxi driver uh, then set out on a very long harangue against um, Hamas, um, and um, I was kind of shocked, uh, not so much that he had criticisms of Hamas, but that he felt quite comfortable telling it to a visiting non like non identified person and i i i i turned to my my fixer afterwards and i said i thought that was really strange that this this the taxi driver felt so free to criticize hamas and he said well gaza isn't egypt and for me that was like a, it was quite a surprising kind of reaction because even though i'd been there before i kind of had the impression that it was sort of like the cc regime in egypt where you couldn't criticize Hamas. So tell me your perception about how the debates flow in Gaza but, about Hamas. Well, it's, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, I'll, I'll get to this point uh, uh, shortly, but I believe that, you know, we have to understand Hamas's conduct in the larger context of the Palestinian conduct. I mean, I do want to sort of reduce the understanding of the situation in Palestine as simply a war between Hamas and Israel. It's a war between the Palestinian people and the Israeli occupation state with all the things that you mentioned. I mean, therefore, and that's and, and that's why there is a, a huge popularity for Hamas in not only in Gaza, but also in the West Bank, Palestinian 1948 territories, and in the Palestinian diaspora, because they see Hamas as not caving in to Israel, as standing up to uh, Israel. Now, the point is, uh, I mean, uh, in, in Gaza, I, there, there's all kinds of different views. Some people agree with Hamas, some people don't agree. And I believe that there is a, a big space for people to speak out on social media, in the streets. And I've, I've got friends and people who criticize Hamas's conduct in, in, in relation to administrative issues, the government supported by, by Hamas, some, some corruption here and there, some um, lack of, of some mismanagement and, and, and so on. But a, by and large, the larger picture is that Hamas's uh, conduct uh, is seen as something that is positive in relation to resistance, in relation to not um, bowing to Israel for in relation to responding to Israel's occupation, colonization, uh, in, uh, in in different ways, whether it is resistance, military resistance, or popular uh, uh, resistance. This is something that has to be all, all the time. Um, uh, politically speaking, I think Hamas has managed over the past seven or eight years to actually to garner most of the Palestinian factions, political factions from Islamic Jihad to Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine to the Democratic Front for the uh, liberation of Palestine to other mm, uh, smaller Palestinian factions. And we would see is that we have a larger consensus about, uh, among most of the Palestinian political factions. They comprise a large percentage of the Palestinian people who are unified in their political agenda, who are unified more or less in their political program uh, and we see that Fatah Sabas is really ostracized and marginalized because they see as Sabas as caving in to Israel, continuing security collaboration with the with the Israeli uh, authorities, Israeli occupation state, while Israelis continue colonization, settlement expansion, Judaization of Jerusalem, this uh, ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians in the West Bank and, and East Jerusalem and the suffocating siege on the Gaza Strip. So, and this apartheid regime, this matrix of control that Israel has imposed for the past decades on the Palestinian people. This is the really the context that we have to bear in mind if you want to understand this, understand Hamas's conduct vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Palestinian factions and vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the, and the world. Um, in relation to Palestine, to Hamas's um, um, sort of uh, national relations, uh, um, I don't think that Hamas, and I haven't seen 
in Hamas's um, um, statements or political statements by leaders or documents, except for the charter, there is no reference to um, sort of establishing an Islamic state an ISIS-like kind of Islamic state. I don't think that this, this kind of mentality is a present among Hamas's um, 2022 20, um, mindset. I believe that they are more of responsive to the variety, to the, um, um, the, the different ideological, cultural, political uh, viewpoints within the Palestinian uh, context, and they are attuned to this. Uh, uh, and, and that's why we see, for example, Hamas is an Islamist uh, sort of uh, outlook, and they are working very closely with, uh, with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which is a Marxist, Leninist uh, a branch of, of ideology. And they are totally in agreement uh, on, uh, on, on most of the Palestinian issues vis-a-vis -vis the PLO reform, vis-a-vis reform, -vis, um, um, against, for example, Abbas's um, uh, collaboration with the Israeli occupation state. So I don't think that we have to think of in, in the way, um, you know, the charter kind of, of thinking, you mean the old charter, but we have to think of the more recent document uh, 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 that Hamas issued in 2017, which I think is the springboard for Hamas's relations internally uh, and uh, externally. Monsieur, that, thank you for that. That brings me back to a question. Jonathan identified himself as a Christian. Um, is Hamas's, um, how, how can you characterize the relations between, uh, how, how, does the, how does the Christian community in Jerusalem or uh, in Palestine, uh, relate to Hamas? Is 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 there is the yeah? How would you characterize it? I guess is the question. Well, uh, I, I think that uh, by and large, well, Christians of course have different opinions, but I would say that the majority of Christians uh, feel very strongly about a uh, secular nationalist uh, regime that respects all religions, but leaves religion out of politics. Uh, I think that would be the position of most uh, Christians and, and a very large number of uh, uh, Palestinian Muslims as well. Uh, I think that Hamas in its treatment of Christians in Gaza, where they are a really, really, really tiny minority has shown that it is sensitive uh, to, to, to their needs and to their uh, demands. Having said that, however, I would say that Christians in the Arab world generally, including Palestine, uh, feel a little bit, uh, I think, disappointed uh, at the failure of secular Arab nationalism to achieve its objectives. And, and they view with some discomfort and, uh, and uh, skepticism and maybe even uh, fear uh, the rise in Islamic movements uh, throughout the Arab world. We continue to be citizens of this of these countries. Uh, as Palestinians, we are proud. We don't even think of ourselves as a minority. We think our, of ourselves as a basic ingredient in Palestinian society, uh, numerically small, but but certainly very significant part of the Palestinian national movement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're going to, in a moment, we're going to turn to the. Uh, can, can, can I yes, just well, interchange um, to John's uh, comment? I, I, I don't think that um, we should, um, I mean, um, Christian, Palestinian Christians are uh, like, we don't have, especially in Palestine. Hello? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Christians, we don't see any, we haven't seen any kind of sectarian um, uh, strife between like Christians and Muslims, especially in Palestine. Palestine is a, a wonderful model of coexistence, of fraternity between Palestinian Christians and Palestinian uh, Muslims. So I don't think that this is an issue that need to be, needs to be considered here. I think Hamas is major contradiction. I believe the Palestinian people's major uh, contradiction is with the Zionist occupation, with Israel as a settler colonial state. I mean, all other 
minor issues are like, we push them aside because this is not the issue. The issue for the Palestinian people, I would say, not for Hamas, not the conflict between Hamas and Israel. It's a conflict between the Palestinian people and the Israeli occupation state that was built on the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people, on the uh, disposition, on the displacement, on this matrix of of control uh, on the colonization. And these are the issues that are pressing for the Palestinian people. And then hence, we see Hamas is very popular in the eyes of many Palestinians. Don't say that all Palestinians are unanimously standing behind uh, Hamas. There are differences in ideology and perception and political outlook. Uh, and, and this is totally acceptable. Nobody ostracizes the other. But we, the Palestinian people, and I think a lot of people around the world are supporting the Palestinian people we, because we see that we are standing up to this regime of uh, occupation, this military regime, this colonial uh, state that was built on the ashes and the ruins of the Palestinian people and Palestinian uh, uh, society. We, the Palestinians, I, and I've seen some very good Christian friends here in, 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 in Gaza, and I see how the um, uh, Palestinian Christians in Gaza are really treated by Hamas's leadership and by the other political uh, factions. They, this is really wonderful, a wonderful example of how Muslims and Christians and I hope that Jews uh, will, will live together at some point in the future when there is just Palestine, when there is a free Palestine where everybody has got his or her equal rights, irrespective of origin, irrespective of ethnicity, irrespective of their religion or ideological uh, uh, affiliation. This is what we want to see, Palestine free, Palestinian people have their self-determination and, and freedom and the return of the refugees and justice achieved. This is the big issue and, and that we need all to work uh, to work on. Thanks, Moshe. I remind people, we're just, I'm just about to turn over to questions from the audience, but please put your questions in the Q&A, not in the chat function. We won't be responding to questions in the Q&A. I have a final question to ask, perhaps directed at the two lawyers. Um, so Canada does not, um, uh, Ken has designated Hamas as a terrorist organization. We refuse to deal with them. What legal steps would it take? Deanna, you probably know more about Canadian law, Jonathan probably about US law, but what's, what practical state steps would have to happen for, would Canada have to stop designating Hamas as a terrorist organization in order to uh, open up channels of communication or could it be done surreptitiously, Diana? It's the, the former, they would have to, and the, look, these designations, by the way, are very political designations. And uh, I, I see, that. <laughs> uh, yes, and, and I say this because I want people to really be aware of, of what it is that we're talking about. Um, the, the fact that Hamas is labeled a terrorist organization, and yet we don't see similar Israeli organizations that have this similar labeling. For example, one of the reasons that these that Hamas has been labeled as such is because of the lack of recognition of Israel, the lack of um, wanting to negotiate with Israel and so on. And yet there isn't with, within Israeli politics, we have members of Knesset, actual members of Knesset, who openly call for the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, who have indicated that um, people like Baruch Goldstein, who was a, uh, a man, uh, a, a physician actually, an American born, Brooklyn born physician, who um, in 1994 went into a mosque as Palestinians were praying in the mosque and gunned down 29 Palestinians. We have currently in the Israeli Knesset, a man named uh, Itamar ben Gvir, who has indicated that this is his hero. He went so far as to dress up as Baruch Goldstein, a man who gunned down 29 Palestinians. Uh, he went to dress up for, as him for Purim. So the idea that we label and focus on one group as somehow being repugnant, but not looking at it in its, in its larger political context, which is that there are Israeli political groups, political parties that are actually represented in the Knesset, some of them who actually had seats as ministers within an Israeli government, that, that somehow they're labeled as being okay and Palestinians are not. 
you know, the, it's, it's this idea that Palestinians are not allowed to resist, that it's the West that defines what is considered to be legitimate resistance. And, when, and, and, uh, and it's also the West that, def that defines whether a person is considered an extremist. In the case of Itamar ben Gvir, he's simply labeled an extremist, even though he openly calls for ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. And in the, label, and in the case of Hamas, um, we, we see countries like Canada saying that, that their resistance is absolutely not allowed. And because they resist, they, for, they therefore get this label of being terrorists. Um, is political at the end of the day. And just in the same way that we saw that the ANC was once labeled a terrorist organization, so too we see that other resistance movements around the world are similarly labeled uh, terrorist organizations. I don't put a lot of weight on that. I think we instead have to look beyond that and start thinking beyond the semantics as, in terms of how it is that we ensure that people get their rights. Well, Jonathan, you want to say something on that? Yes, yes. I totally agree that the designation terrorist is a political one and that uh, the government can change that at any time. Uh, what that designation does is, is both prohibit government officials, especially at the lower levels, uh, from taking an initiative of contacting uh, Hamas, uh, but it also provides an opportunity for civil society to do something about that designation. When the PLO was designated an, a terrorist organization, churches, unions, civic leaders went and deliberately violated US law to meet with Yasser Arafat, to meet with the PLO, to bring them into the, into the political process. And that was a courageous act. Uh, today, we don't see anybody taking a courageous act of meeting with Hamas officials, whether it's in, in Europe or in Gaza uh, or in Turkey or elsewhere. If we are going to break through the current paralysis in the political process, if we are going to do anything about Gaza, we need to work with Hamas. That's, that's just the, the, the reality of it. Just like I can't say uh, I, I wanna make peace with the Israelis, but I don't wanna talk with with, with anybody who's a Zionist. That, that, that's ridiculous. I need to talk with people who I disagree with, even fundamentally disagree with, if I want to arrive at peace. And this is an opportunity for the peace camp, for the, uh, the progressive uh, people who really want to see uh, an end to the conflict, I, to, to actually do something. Uh, it, it may be costly, it may be an act of civil disobedience. It may be illegal in some countries, but that's the only way you can move the process forward rather than uh, just uh, allow the current quagmire to continue. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Diana, for that. I'm going to move now to, well, to pick up questions I have in the Q&A. I picked up a couple, and I'm counting on Yasmin to flag a couple as well. There's a couple of questions around the Islamic University of Gaza. Um, uh, one was, um, why is it called the Is Islamic uh, University? And I might sort of, well, we have Catholic universities here. It's, it's not all that unusual. But the other is, um, does that does Hamas um, uh, put any effort, any com constraints on you as a professor as to what books you can study or whatever? Uh, in, in Canadian universities, uh, universities may bring pressure on organizations trying to organize events on campus, but I don't think there's many cases where the actual in Canada, where instructors have been told what they can and cannot do. But uh, what about what, what's your situation, Mashir? Well, I mean, I'm I, I'm the head of the English department, uh, English literature and la and English language in the Islamic University. I don't see any kind of restrictions on what students study in my in my department. I mean, they study all kinds of uh, literature, uh, American literature and uh, British literature, Elizabethan era, the Victorian literature in 20th century contemporary uh, English literature as well as American literature. They, they would read works from William Wordsworth to Christopher Marlowe to Shakespeare to all kinds of, of writers and, uh, and authors. Jane Austen, you know, I mean, it, it's not that, uh, I mean, we, the, our students study basically 
um, um, Western literature uh, and, and uh, resistance literature and world literature and they study courses like comparative literature and so on. I don't see any, um, again, any restrictions. We are open to, um, you know, uh, for, for our students to study uh, and to learn and to have a, an excellent learning opportunity. Thank you. There are also a couple of questions about the origins of Hamas. Um, as I, I, as some have pointed out that I've, I've read that Israel facilitated or encouraged uh, the creation of Hamas at the beginning. I don't know if that's if who, who might like to answer that question on the panel. And um, does to, to, today does Israel uh, encourage the divisions between the ongoing divisions between Hamas and Fatah and other organizations? But I have a volunteer to address that, Jonathan. You well, unmuted. well, yes. Uh, yeah. there, there have been many reports, including I've heard some Israeli officials uh, in uh, discussions and think tanks uh, admit that Hamas was initially created uh, as a counterbalance to the secular uh, nationalist uh, PLO. So it was like a counterbalance and an attempt to divide and conquer. Certainly today, uh, Israel strategically follows a line of insisting on keeping separation, uh, not only between Hamas and uh, Fatah, but also between Gaza and the West Bank. Even if they have the same policy, they try to always treat the two uh, a little bit differently because that's part of their strategic policy of fragmentation of the Palestinian community. So on the one hand, they say, we can't negotiate with Palestinians because they're not united. On the other hand, any steps they take towards unity, yeah, Israel will very strongly uh, oppose, and publicly well, so. Well, Hamas's uh, origin would go back to the 40s and the 50s of the uh, last centuries. I mean, it traces goes back to um, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, the, the main Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And there was the uh, Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood in the 40s and the 50s and onward. Uh, so Hamas was there, but it was like kind of the Islamic uh, um, sort of movement, not named Hamas. Hamas was named only in the early, in the first Palestinian uprising or first Palestinian uh, um, uh, intifada. It has a following. Uh, it had a following even before the, uh, during the 80s and the uh, 70s. But there is some uh, credibility to the point that it was, I mean, the Israeli occupation, while they arrested Hamas's leader, during the 80s and early 90s, uh, uh, it, it gave some space for uh, Hamas to rise, to counterbalance the PLO's Fatah uh, movement at the time as a kind of, uh, because it was much more popular at the, at the time. Um, but uh, uh, like Hamas is, uh, was, was there, we can say that it, it only existed in the early 19, uh, in, in the early Palestinian, first Palestinian intifada. There's, um, thank you. There's a, um, a question here about how to answer the charge that um, Hamas won't recognize Israel's right to exist. Who wants to tackle that? That, that is something that comes up a lot. And um, it's not an easy question to answer. It's, it's easy to sort of dismiss it, but it's not really very easy to answer to someone who's actually worried about the issue. Can, Diana, do you want to take a crack at that? How would you answer it? You know, Peter, I'm still waiting for somebody to recognize Palestine's right to exist. And I'm still waiting for any one of these Israeli governments to not only recognize Palestine's right to exist, but to recognize what they did to Palestinians in 1948. They ethnically cleansed the place. And so this idea that we get caught up in whether uh, Hamas has recognized Israel, when we haven't yet seen a single Israeli government recognize Palestine and Palestine's right to exist or the right of Palestinians to exist. In fact, all that we've seen over the course of the past seven decades is an attempt to try to erase us from the place, erase our language from the place, erase our history from the place, erase our culture from the place, as well as erase our 
our towns, our homes, et cetera. I, I, as I was telling you at the start of this, uh, Peter, you know, my father was a man who, who survived the Nakba at age nine. Nine years old, he was ethnically cleansed from his homeland and turned into a refugee. My father just passed away in November of 2021. And for all of these years that my father was alive, 82 years, all that he ever talked about was not only the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, but the wholesale destruction of, of his life, of Palestinian cities, of, the, of Palestinian history, and how it was just a struggle for him just to be able to hold on to Arabic. So who is it that hasn't recognized whom exactly? I am so tired of that question. I think instead of looking at uh, these semantics of recognition, et cetera, we should be asking, what is it that has been actually done? And what's been done is that Israel has attempted to wipe us off the map and we cannot continue to ignore that and somehow hide behind some semantics of whether uh, Hamas has or has not recognized Israel. It's, it's such a, it's the wrong path to be going down. Well, I'm, I totally agree with John. I mean, this, Kind of this question basically masquerades the issue. It diverts attention from the root cause of the whole situation here. I mean, we're talking about Israel's colonization, Israel's ethnic cleansing, Israel's military, brutal military occupation, Israel's apartheid. And if you want to recognize Israel, you have to recognize and to accept and to treat as normal Israel's ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. So this is really an acceptable and unacceptable request uh, to the Palestinians, how should you, how can you ask the Palestinians to recognize Israel as the occupier, as the colonizer, as the, the oppressor? I mean, this is really uh, unacceptable. And on, on, in a related vein, I mean, the PLO recognized Israel in the Oslo agreements as part of this Oslo Accords. And what do you see, what do you see in, their, in, in their turn? You saw more colonization, more settlement expansion, uh, more Judaization of, of, uh, of Jerusalem, more and more cantonization of the Palestinian uh, territories. You see the Palestinians dream for liberation, for self-determination elapsing day and night. And you see more and more radicalization within the Palestine, within the Israeli community. You see that the whole society is shifting towards the right and the far right. And you never heard any Israeli leader on the right or on the left or in the mainstream recognizing the, palace, the right of the Palestinian people to statehood, the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. So it's really the issue of Hamas's or the Palestinians recognizing Israel is really off um, is, is unacceptable in the first place. Israel has got to recognize, it's like asking the Ukrainian people to accept Russia's invasion and Russia's uh, occupation of Ukraine. This is really unacceptable. And I don't think anyone in the West, in Canada or in America or in Britain or elsewhere in Western Europe would accept that the Ukrainians uh, totally succumb to uh, Putin's uh, uh, intent on occupying the land and besieging the cities and displacing the millions of people. We have a similar ano uh, analogy here. The Palestinians will never, and no one dares to ask the Palestinians to recognize Israel because Israel is not a normal state. It's not like a neighboring state. Israel is a settler colonial state. And we have to keep always talking about this and remind people of this. Israel is not Norway or Sweden. Israel was a settler, is still a settler colonial state that continues till today subjugates the Palestinians to colonization and ethnic cleansing and apartheid. I'm not saying this. You've got Amnesty International in its most recent um, uh, report condemns Israel's apartheid. So um, I think this is off the question. I mean, we have to tell things like it is uh, uh, and not to yield to Israelis propagandists and apologists. Uh, Israel has no legitimacy as long as it continues to oppress the Palestinians and subjugates them to uh, more and more ethnic cleansing, more and more displacement, and more and more brutalities, whether in Gaza or the West Bank or East Jerusalem or the Palestine. You've got millions of Palestinian refugees scattered in refugee camps inside Palestine and in neighboring countries, and I've got millions of others, you know, around the world. This is really, these are the real issues um, that we have to always um, uh, keep before eyes 
Uh, and peace will remain always, will always remain elusive as long as we don't address things for what they are. Israel has got to stop. Israel's occupation has got to stop. Uh, as simple as that. Jonathan, I see you want a green hand. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I'd like to take a, uh, a, a slightly more positive uh, spin on that. I, I will acknowledge that between Palestinian nationalism and the Zionist movement, the, the, there is this absolute existential clash. If you want to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, you're negating Palestinians. And for Palestinians, for Israelis to recognize uh, Palestine is to admit that their own uh, state, their own existence is, is illegal and illegitimate. Uh, I, I try to deal with this contradiction in, 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 in my book, Beyond the Two-State uh, Solution, uh, I think somebody put it in the chat box and maybe they yes. can do it again. You can download it for free. It's a short uh, essay, basically, that says that uh, Palestinian nationalism and Zionism need to uh, come up with a solution that accepts or, or that changes the formula uh, to accept the other and to create a single state that acknowledges the needs and the fears and the hopes uh, of, of, of both groups. And I think it is possible. You can't start by totally negating the other. Uh, no matter how legitimate your criticism are of the other, uh, we must find a formula that incorporates both. Uh, Israel needs to realize there is such a thing as a Palestinian people, and they are entitled to self-determination. And Palestinians need to recognize that there's about 7 million Jews living in their uh, land uh, so that Palestine, Arabia, Palestine can no longer be exclusively Arab. It's both Arab and Jewish. And it is possible for it to be both. Uh, this is what I uh, at least opined. And maybe this is a little more positive than just critiquing uh, each uh, point of view, which is not to say that they are symmetrical, but but it is important, I think, to to deal with both uh, sides of the of the equation. Thank you, Jonathan. I see that Karen Rodman put a link to the book uh, in the chat, which is great. I thought it was a very uh, interesting approach that you were trying to uh, work out what's the bottom line for each side, and I thought that was um, a very productive approach to the discussion. I'm going to turn to my colleague Yasmin Abulkasim for some. I've been so fascinated by the discussion, I haven't been paying very close attention to the questions. So, Yasmin, have you got some questions you can throw to the panelists? Sorry, Peter. Thank you all for being here with us. Um, I'm going to start with a question. Actually, I think Diana, you had partially answered it, but I'm going to I'm going to repose it um, to Moshir. Um, someone said, "Wouldn't Hamas have greater support internationally if they could?" shift to nonviolent tactics or at least renounce indiscriminate targeting of Israeli civilians. Is there a move towards Gandhi-like nonviolent resistance within Hamas and Palestine more generally? Well, I mean, uh, um, uh, Hamas and the Palestinian people are no stranger to, to nonviolent uh, popular resistance. Uh, the most recent is what's going on in Berlin and in, 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 uh, in other parts of the West Bank. You have the Palestinians facing with their bare chests uh, 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 the Israeli colonial settlers and the Israeli occupation uh, on the hills and the mountains in, 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 in Nablus and other areas. Uh, Hamas and, and also in, in 2018 and 2019, there were the great popular, great return marches uh, which were brutally uh, suppressed by the Israeli occupation uh, soldiers. Over 240 uh, and 15 Palestinians were killed by the Israelis. They were killed by sharpshooters, killing children. And we all, we can all recall the images and the pictures of the children being sniped by Israeli uh, occupation uh, soldiers. There were thousands of Palestinians engaged in uh, marches, engaged in popular protests close to the border fence with the Israeli occupation, calling for return, calling for an end to the siege on the Gaza Strip. And so this is not really, uh, Hamas is not engaging in, in, in only in military uh, resistance, but we see the Palestinian people, including Hamas, are engaged in popular resistance, but whether popular, I believe, my own personal viewpoint, whether it is 
military or popular, we're facing the same fate, which is confronting a settler colonial state that is intent on displacing the Palestinians, that intent on um, turning the Palestinian territories into Bantustans, surrounded by settlements, surrounded by military installation, installations, surrounded by Israeli military occupations, and displaced uh, on, an eth- on, on a slow pace. I mean, there is a slow ethnic cleansing uh, in the West Bank and um, in East Jerusalem. Look at the population of the colonial settlers, settlers in the West Bank, close to 1 million people in 2020, as opposed to a few hundred thousands in early 90s. I mean, the situation is rather com- uh, complex. And we have to uh, consider the, uh, I mean, to point the fingers at the Israeli occupation. All Palestinian responses, I'm not talking about Hamas's only, because I don't like this kind of reductionist, simplistic view of the conflict as it is a war between Hamas and, and, and the Israeli occupation. It is a war between, or a struggle that the Palestinian people are waging against this settler colonial occupation. And they are entitled to popular, and they indeed engage in popular resistance. We as ordinary Palestinians on every day, not only in the Gaza Strip, but also in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, we are so attached, we are so deeply rooted in our land, in our towns, in our villages, in our hills, in our mountains, in in everywhere. Look at the people, the the valiant people of Sheikh Jarrah. They're refusing to leave their homes and they are resisting the the radical, the extremist settlers as well as the Israeli occupation uh, forces. Uh, uh, and, and, and the same thing with the Palestinians in Gaza. They've been subjected to siege, to a suffocating siege, depriving them of their basic uh, uh, needs for one purpose. They are refusing to uh, yield to Israel, to keep in, to accept the brutality of this, this regime as something that is normal. And I believe that Hamas is, I mean, tried to resist in all forms of resistance, which are entitled, the Palestinian people are entitled to all forms of resistance, whether it is military or uh, popular. Look at the Ukrainians, for example, they took the arms. I mean, they, they're, they're engaged in military resistance and nobody blamed them. Nobody uh, sort of denounced them as uh, terrorists. So basically we're, we're, we, we want to draw that analogy that which is similar to the situation in Palestine. And similar, all the free peoples, let's remember this, they, um, uh, they resisted the occupation. The, the Algerians in, in, uh, against the French colonization, the Americans against the British occupation um, hundreds of years ago and everywhere. This is something that is um, God-given, the right to resist is God-given as well as it is mandated by the international law. You have a right to resist in all forms of resistance in line with the international law, in line, in line with the preserving the sanctity of a human life. This is the issues that we have to consider, I believe. Um, Moshir, you, you talked about your attachment to Gaza. I do remember there's nothing quite like visiting a place to change your views of things. I remember I was teaching an English class um, one afternoon in Gaza, and the young women who were teaching English, I was just there on an occasional basis. We weren't competing with the Islamic University's English departments. Okay. Um, I was, um, and I, um, the the young women talked about how they would like to travel, and um, I asked them where they would like to live, and they all said they'd like to live in Gaza. And I, I, this is white chauvinism. I just assumed that they would all prefer to live in Canada. I mean, it, but no, I said no. It's where my family is. It's where my history is. My grandfather is. That's where the food is. And I, I was sort of shocked and a bit dismayed at myself for having um, assumed that because it's dangerous in Gaza or they're trapped there, that that's they really want to get out as fast as they can and they all want to go travel well basically myself i was i I lived in australia i worked in a university there i had a permanent job a 10-year job at the university there in sydney and i decided to go back to gaza and if the people were saying are you crazy are you going are you mad going back to gaza what are you going to do here and i'm happy living here in gaza of course life is difficult and I've gone through difficult uh, times, me, my family, and my friends, and the whole community here. But this is our homeland. This is our town. This is where we lived, and we were going to die. So basically, we are attached to this land, uh, uh, and we do want to leave. I mean, this is uh, something that is very close to our heart. 
Uh, I used to live in Gaza too, Peter, and oh. uh, I, I, uh, I'm not allowed to live there any longer. Uh, and uh, I know exactly what Moshe is, is talking about. There's something that pulls you there. And I've lived in many places around the world, but there's something very special about Gaza. Thank you for sharing that. Yasmin? Sure, I've got one more question. Um, so I'm gonna pose this one to you, Diana. Mm -hmm. um, Grafton said, the PLO nominally represents Palestinians everywhere and the international community recognizes the PLO as the sole representative of the Palestinian people. So is the way forward through reform and greater inclusiveness in the PLO and how can that be achieved? Oh gosh, that's a webinar in and of itself. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion now for 15 years, maybe longer about reforming the PLO, mostly because of the fact that we've seen this split, we're coming up on our 15 year of split between Hamas and Fatah but also because, um, because there hasn't been a revitalization of, of, of the PLO, which is to say that if you look at the people who are representing the PLO, these are people who don't mirror the demographics of Palestine, age-wise, gender-wise, um, in, in geographically, uh, politically, any of these sorts of things. And so reform of the PLO is something that many younger people have been calling for. But then there's another shift of people who are saying that we need to just do away with it and come up with something that is completely different, that it worked for the time um, that was in the, in, in, you know, in, the, in the 20th century. But now here we are in the 21st century and we need something completely different that represents, that looks like us and represents us and so on. So um, I, I do strongly believe in reform, but because we haven't had any real elections within really any of the political parties for quite some time, I think that it's going to be very difficult to reform the PLO, and we need to have to we need to start having these very serious conversations internally about what's going to happen when the inevitable happens, which is Mahmoud Abbas um, passes away, or 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 anything, any of the other multitude of things that can happen. So it's a it's a webinar in and of itself. Well, maybe we'll get you to come back sometime, uh, Dana, for another webinar. I know you're very busy to to. doing webinars. Um, I'm going to ask one more, uh, make one more comment here, and then I'm going to uh, move towards wrapping up here. We're going to wrap up at quarter two. A um, uh, question was asked uh, about what Palestinian support organizations there are in Canada that one can join. Uh, I will, in a follow-up email, I will make reference to a number of the more prominent ones are CJPME, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. Another is Independent Jewish Voices Canada, which is a Jewish organization, but they accept non-Jews as members. There's a United Church organization called um, Anjapi, United Network for Justice and Peace in Palestine and Israel. Uh, there's also uh, various Mennonite organizations. I will uh, include links to those in a follow-up email that I send to everyone. Um, my organization, the Ottawa Forum in Israel-Palestine, uh, is not really a Palestinian support organization. We are a human rights organization, and we are bringing human rights issues to Canadians. And clearly in this issue, we are very concerned about human rights for Palestinians. So we're an educational organization, and we're glad to have people subscribe to our monthly monthly newsletter. Uh, and the power, the, the, I just want to share screen. I ask my three uh, guests, please not to leave. I'm going to thank you in a second, but I want to just make a few comments about what's coming up, if you wouldn't mind. Can I share screen, um, Yasmin, please? Next, next, next. So, so I, I want to remind you that my organization, OFIP, is voluntary and self-financed. We don't have any sources of, uh, of income. Um, any donations are gratefully accepted by sending an e-transfer to this address, ofip.finance at gmail.com. And we live hand to mouth and um, we are not, we, we do not give tax receipts and we've done that on purpose because we don't want to be looking over our shoulder at what uh, Revenue Canada might be accepting as a, a charitable donation or not. Next slide. Um, 
So I want to remind you about our next webinar, which will be on the 21st of April. We're going to focus on this question of um, whether it's fair to call Israel an apartheid state. And when I say Israel here, I'm referring to this, the current state of Israel. Um, I think amongst the people who attend this webinar, they would be easily convinced that what happens in the West Bank, uh, East Jerusalem is apartheid, but there's a lot less clarity about the situation of Israel itself. Um, Israel, which claims to be a, a Jewish and democratic state, and we will have the uh, help from Jonathan Cook uh, to analyze the, the practical and structural impediments that make Palestinian citizens of Israel, like Diana, uh, second-class citizens um, in Israel. And it's up to you to decide whether or not you think the apartheid label is appropriate. Next slide. Oh, yeah, so if you want to get more information on OFIP, you can go to our website at www.ottawaforumip.org. And I also do a weekly blog post on the Israel-Palestine question as it impacts Canada. And it's to be found at canadatalksisraelpalestine.ca. And I will send that a link in a follow-up email to you all. Okay, that's the end of that. Um, we can end the uh, share screen. I just want to come back to give a final thank you to uh, everybody. First of all, I want to thank you uh, to Yasmin Abulkasim in the background for helping me with this. Uh, for many months, I fumbled badly in our webinars. I think I've, our game has been upped, and I, have, uh, that, I attribute that all to, all to her. Um, I want to thank our three presenters uh, today for taking time out of their own schedules. It's uh, late in the evening, uh, in, for, at least for Adana and for uh, Moshir, a little bit less so for Jonathan, who is right now in, in Ohio. So, Diana, thank you so much for um, joining us, sharing us your insights. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you uh, with us. Um, uh, Jonathan, thank you for fitting it into your busy travel schedule. And I do recommend people take a look at Jonathan's book, as well as the link to the article that I put in the chat before. And uh, finally, I want to thank my friend Moshir. Amer uh, at the University, <laughs> <laughs> at the, at the University, the University of Gaza. Uh, thank you so thank much you for everybody for attending and uh, have a good afternoon or evening. Um, thank you. There you go. Bye-bye. All the very best. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care.